This is Asia Tech Podcast, Asia Matters, a special edition today, joined by two special guests. My name's Graham Brown, Jeffrey Hanley. Hello. Welcome. Thank you very much. It's great to have you here. Great to be here. Yeah. We're in a different city, different venue this time. It's catching nice up. place you got here. Yeah, it's good. Well, you know, it's good to have you here. I think we've had a few false starts in our meetings, but we've finally made it into the same studio. It's good to have you. Awesome. Chris Grimshaw-Jones. Hello. How you doing? Good, mate. How are you? Yeah, very good. Yeah. And I, I want to sort of kick off before we sort of go into the subject of what you guys do and your, you know, your global adventures and also China, China matters. Let's talk about where you're from, both of you, because you both got a lilt to your accents. <laughs> Kiwis. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's it, mate. That's where, it. where are you from? You're from? Yes, yeah, so I was uh, born in uh, Bangkok, mm. uh, to Thai mother. In, uh, Kiwi father, grew up in uh, Auckland, New Zealand. Uh, yeah, been there all my life. Uh, as I started to uh, get older in late 20s, started venturing out into Asia, seeing the, the potential there and sort of, yeah, haven't really looked back. Is it sort of like a natural place for you to come back to? Like, I mean, because you na now you're sort of in between Shanghai and Hong Kong and so on. Yeah, yeah. I mean, to be honest, I do feel quite at home anywhere in Asia. You know, yeah. I just sort of feel like I just fit in. It just seems to, seems to work. It's, yeah. it's easy. Uh, some of the food can be a bit iffy sometimes, but yeah, Asian sure. food. Yeah, oh. I love it. Just it, all one word: food. Asian food. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's that thing, that noodle thing, isn't yeah. it? <laughs> it's the, That's what they eat in Asia. <laughs> no, Chris has just got an aversion to. It's just one thing, as far as I know. Slime. From what I know, yeah, it's, it's just it's slight. If it's slimy, then it doesn't go, and it doesn't really matter if it's Asian, French. South American, whatever. If it's slimy, it doesn't happen with Chris. And right. I can understand that. Well, that you know? would have been those eggs we were talking yeah. about. Yeah, right? <laughs> <laughs> Here in Singapore, the soft-boiled eggs. Yeah. Are you a fan of those, Barra? No. <laughs> Even the locals. All right. Cool. Jeff, yourself, you've got a really interesting story. For those that don't know you so well, especially over this side in, here in Singapore, mm -hmm. um, you're Kiwi by birth. Where, where no, actually so, were I you mean, born? Yeah, I, I have, uh, have a love for New Zealand and am a uh, New Zealand citizen and a supporter of the country, absolutely, and a proud citizen. But I was born in Hong Kong, uh, fifth generation, my mother's side, my mother's uh, uh, Malay Chinese, and my father's Scottish. And so the Kiwi isn't there in the blood or anything. Mm. But my youngest brother was born in New Zealand. I have aunties, uncles, cousins. They kind of migrated over there from Hong Kong uh, back in the day. Mm. And my parents took us out there uh, prior to Hong Kong being handed back to, to China. So let me get that right. Malay, Chinese, Scottish, Hong Kong based. Born in Hong Kong. Yeah. Grew up a bit in New Zealand. Yeah, went to university in New Zealand. Started a uh, started many of my businesses in New Zealand. Um, and uh, but you know have been been Chinese since uh, since birth basically. I mean, right. I've always viewed my viewed myself uh, as from from here from China. From really? From Asia. Absolutely. Yeah, my my yeah. grandmother raised me. Um, so your grandmother physically looked Chinese as well, being Malay Chinese, yeah. and would have had all the Chinese customs you're oh, familiar yeah. with in oh, yeah. mainland China, right? No, speak fluent Cantonese, Mandarin, so yeah. Yeah. So it's, uh, it's part and parcel of life. My parents moved to Shanghai before I did as well. Right. I mean, my parents were kind of were the, the, the beachhead before. Um, they're no longer there. They, they now live uh, in, in Bangkok. But um, yeah, they, they, were in, you know, they moved up to there, and I followed uh, a few years later in 2005. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I, the first time I went to the mainland was 1989, mm. when I was 13, something like that. So it's, I mean, it's it's always been exciting. It's always been in in the, in the blood. And Dad did a lot of business up there when we were kids. So yeah. you know, he would always have stories about what what was going on, and be painting this picture for us. Um, but he was a Scot. Yeah, he was a Scot, but he left Scotland when he was very young. Basically, as soon as he could leave, he left. Yeah. Um, he, you know, he wasn't exactly. Have you been back? I, I used to go back every uh, every summer when I was when I was small. Because uh, I was just wondering where the name like Handley is that a Scottish it's name? English, yeah, yeah, it's English. Um, I think Dad, Dad, uh, my my granddad had two dads, and there's like a Nicholson in there and something. I mean, it's a weird. They were, you know, they weren't they weren't from a wealthy background. They typical Glasgow, Glaswegian, Clyde right. Bank council houses. Yeah, um, you that's know, where my family were from. Yeah. Shipbuilders. Yeah, no, or no, yeah, ship shit builders. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> <laughs> they shut the ship up. They we shut had the, the factories yeah, yeah. down. Right, right yeah, exactly. And it was pretty depressing, pretty depressed. But yeah. Yeah, I used to go back out there every every summer as a kid, and then didn't go out for years, and went back a couple of years ago, literally a couple yeah. of years ago. A friend was getting married um, up in uh, in the north, and so we went back to Clyde Bank and uh, went back and had a look to at where my 
the house that my dad was born in, wow. and the house that I used to go back to every summer. And you remember it? Yeah, I mean, I, I, nothing's changed. Yeah, like, I t- that's amazing. Though, I isn't could it? tell you what was going to happen. But when physically, we physically, yeah. you, you probably look more like somebody from that region. And, but or you, you Mediterranean, or right. n- well, uh, Sa- what, I mean, yeah, Mediterranean, <laughs> uh, Saudi Arabian, what you uh, Pakistani, yeah, okay. uh, yeah, you that. know, all the Filipino, uh, you know, you look- name it, I get it, right? Right. Okay. It's fascinating because, I mean, there is a conversation there. We, we've chatted a little bit about mm. this as well, but I want to bring Chris in as well. Well, he's this. the same. I mean, he's yeah. half Thai, half New yeah. Zealand. So. Well, well, what is that? Because, I mean, it's, I mean, obviously I know what that <laughs> is, but I mean, what does it do for you in the sense of bi- and what you do in your business? Because I think it equips you with something that mm. normal people would no, not You have. just said we're not normal. <laughs> well, I consider myself as part of your group. So, you know, I'm not normal in the sense that, you know, people think that I'm, well, I'm, obviously born in Britain, but I have a, a mixed background as well. So there's British, there's Irish, there's a little bit of Greek in there as well. You can well. see it there. So, yeah, Brown no, colour. Like, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, and it's just like one of those things when you grow up, people are like, well, what are you? And you, you, at first you're sort of like, yeah, well, yeah, I'm British, I grew up here. But then you sort of question that rather than what people have told you you are, you start to say, actually, I can choose. How about for yourself? I mean, these sort of questions that you sort of thought about now you're sort of sitting with investors and entrepreneurs and you're seeing this whole sort of like global industry emerge in the startup ecosystem as well does it sort of give you any kind of advantage that people who are locals don't have yeah i think like uh, appreciation for cultures around the world you know it really really helps there um i mean uh, yeah <laughs> I think the lens is is really important like when we when we were, went to thailand together the first time last year or beginning this year or whatever and it, it was almost like a homecoming right like a, a kind of a positioning like for, for Chris coming back there it's like if we're going to do something here if you're going to move there or whatever it was it's mm. like well the place of your birth not where you grew up and you come back now not for a holiday not for a, a jaunt but to come back to maybe help build stuff maybe mm. help bridge countries bridge economies things like that um I think same feeling I have um, when we talk about China and when we do go back to New Zealand as well, we just blend right in because we're Kiwis. I mean, <laughs> we're just Kiwis at, you know, on, on the outside and on the inside. Mm. But we, at least I feel I think we can, we're peace brokers to a point as well, right? Like when, when there's a conversation and there's two yeah. sides and people are like, well, that, that, that kind of sucks and they suck and whatever. It's like, well, hang on a second. Because inherently we can't really be racist, right? Mm. It's very difficult for, for someone of mixed blood to be racist, mm. even though we don't look like we're mixed blood. You just, you can't. Yeah. Otherwise you hate yourself. So I think it gives us a, an appreciation of, as Chris said, the cultures, the customs, the way that business is done. Maybe, I don't know about you, Chris, but I know for me, sometimes if my first thought is, that's, that's ridiculous. I tell myself my first thought might be wrong. Yeah. And I have an out, basically. I can almost give myself a, a, like a free pass card to myself mentally to say, it's okay, you're allowed to look in there because you are your half, so you can go in there. And, right. and it allows you to just push a little bit further where most people would just go, oh, that's just ridiculous, write right. it off and move to the next thing. Yeah. So I think we get... Maybe a bit more sort of mental flexibility. Yeah. That's what it is, isn't it? Tolerance of different ideas. And yeah. you, you, I think you have to be in our space. I mean, just thinking back, for, I, I know you've got a, a young boy as well. Mm. How old is he now? Uh, seven months. Seven months. The so size of what, though? Two years yeah, old. Yeah, he's actually <laughs> off, <laughs> he's actually off the, been feeding off, him? Off the size scale when they measure the babies, you know. <laughs> <laughs> young adult now. <laughs> yeah, well, it's funny because my mum's like, you know, like just on five feet and like she holds him and he's like, you know, like oh half, her, half her size. Right, so he would be a real mix as well. Mm. So that's fascinating. Yeah, yeah. So he's, um, I mean, like on my side, you know, my dad's like Irish, Welsh, and Scottish. Right. Um, grew up in New Zealand, sort of thing. Um, and my mum's Siamese, you know, Thai. Mm. Uh, so he's, you know, quarter Thai, and he's sort of got that sort of caramel skin color, sort of thing. Yeah. Um, you know, you've walked down the road, and old ladies come up to you going, oh. <laughs> you know, like, yeah. So it's it's cool. It's cool. Yeah. You know, and I think. Um, you know, I really want to make an effort as he grows up to sort of take him to lots of different cultures and countries around the world. So he yeah, sort of grows uh, up with that that sort of um, appreciation for, for different people around the world. It's, I think it's really important. That's especially, a real education, yeah. Yeah, especially in New Zealand, you know, it's quite easy to sort of uh, feel like, you know, like a lot of times Kiwis, they when they do venture out, they're like, oh, wow, like, you know, the world's so big because, you know, you're all the way down the bottom there, tucked yeah. away. And 
all you really know about is from New Zealand and Australia, maybe England, and then you know you venture out into Asia, and it's like wow, you know you got five, six times more people than the yeah, whole country in blown. the city. Yeah, it's, it's that's amazing. Really. Yeah, d- do it. Take yeah. him, take him on the road. My 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 boy's half Japanese, half English. Well, mm-hmm. half English plus Ooh. all that mix that I just <laughs> described, you know, before. And um, just to the conversations that he had when he, I mean, he's asked me as he's got older. He's asked me like, "What am I? Am I, <laughs> am I white?" Because when he goes to school in Japan, he's a foreigner, yeah. right? And th- there's a specific word in um, Japanese. It's the same, I think, in Chinese as well. It's like like outside person, like gaijin, yep. and the characters I think are the same, same. in Chinese, yeah. right? Which j- basically means outside person. Foreign devil in Chinese. <laughs> okay. <Yeah. laughs> it's a little more so more a foreign dark. ghost, basically. Right. Yeah. yeah. So it, it's a very, you know, it's in the mindset as well. So he's asked me those kind of questions. But, uh, you know, years ago when I, was, I sold a telecoms business, we thought, well, I don't want to start another business. Let's go and travel the world. So he was six years old. And I thought, what's the best education you can have? Mm. So we went all these different places. Went to New Zealand and yeah. went to Japan and all that. And I thought, you know, if I, when he's older, when he sort of goes out into the world of work, they're going to need people who yep. can kind of like bridge Japan and China or China and America. And it's going to be these sort of bo- boundaryless people, right? That education that they don't necessarily teach at school. People who are just natural. It's like, oh, I see you for who you are and like what you're trying to do with your life rather than kind of where you came from. Because that's a very complicated story anyway, isn't it? So, you know, I think that has a real space, you know, moving on to the whole startup thing. Yep. You know, when we're going global. You know, we need to kind of think like this. Otherwise, we'll get real, you know, territorial and absolutely. tribal about it. I mean, absolutely. And I think that that helped me as a founder. Uh, your last business that you're in is, is a cross-border e-commerce. Um, it helps us as investors, whether it's to uh, LPs or potential LPs that are asking us, well, well, why, why, why do you think you have a yeah. have an edge on this, this, this China thing? And you don't have to... That, you know, there's no degrees. There's no. There's no. Uh, there's no exit for that. There's. A, it's. It's just. It's our being. It's. It's. Mm. It's our DNA, right? I mean, if anyone's, if there was a qualification, it's b- almost. Like, I'm allowed at the table, cause, but I'm born, mm. right? Like that. And then the rest is just what I've performed, right? Yeah. The rest is the rest is effort, and I think it's 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 powerful. Mm. Um, and when you talk to founders, whether they're uh, mixed teams, uh, Chinese teams, or, or, or completely foreign teams, there is an appeal to each group um, for what we bring uh, from that perspective. Uh, a lot of it is this, you get me, and you get, in inverted commas, them. Yeah, right? the, the, yeah. the them that I need, whether it's them, the outside world, or them that's inside China. And it, and it helps us, um, because it's, it's, it's genuine, I think. Yeah. Right? I mean, it's from a from a real place absolutely well i mean as well there's been studies done on this as well i mean if you read the book uh wisdom of the crowds by james surawicki i think you know the jelly bean test where they put jelly beans in a jar and they ask people to guess how many jelly beans like the country fe- mm. fate type thing and they say how many jelly i mean you don't know so they give it to groups of people and they found that the more diverse the group was particularly in like their backgrounds the better they were at guessing because if you had just like one group of people, like all Scots, for example, just as an, I'm not picking on the Scots, mm-hmm. but as an example, all guessing together. They wouldn't guess. They'd tip it out and count <laughs> them all and put them all back in and say, don't touch them. The, They're yeah, mine. Exactly. <laughs> you can have one. <laughs> <laughs> and if you're good, you can have another one tomorrow. Mm. So, But you, there you have that sort of culture which creates, and you know, you, got, you kind of think how that sort of impacts innovation as well, in that sort of diversity, how important that is. So, all right, well, let's talk about what you guys do in that space. You know, Hightail Capital, what are you about? Let's uh, talk about that. A uh, early stage, uh, I guess, in vernacular cross-border um, in investment firm, VC firm. Um, that's the kind of label. Uh, what, how, what we are, we're founders. GPs are founders. We're not founder-friendly, founder-focused. We're founders. Um, so we, we understand uh, uniquely understand that we're founders with you were entre- entrepreneurs before this yeah. as well. You've got quite yeah. a good so track record as well. So we've yeah. got you know multiple exits, uh, multiple forms of exits as well uh, in uh, across different continents. Um, so we've built, failed, built, succeeded, exited, whatever, and we're using those um, those learnings, those lenses uh, from a VC perspective. Mm. The other difference is uh, is the macro approach that we have. Um, the thesis that, that we pulled together uh, basically doesn't look at a sector or a technology 
or a ge geography. It's not about China. It's not about blockchain. It's not, it's you know, it's it's um it's a it's a macro driven thesis. We yeah. look at um as you titled in the beginning, China matters. Yeah. Uh, we look at a global China macro, uh, where China, f for the first time ever, a single country's domestic policy has been able to impact the whole world. A domestic policy, not foreign policy, mm. has been able to impact and change the, the whole world. And so we, we identified uh, four key areas that, um, that we look at, four themes, if you will. Uh, care, which is anything from child care, elder care, health care, uh, insurance, etc. Uh, culture, um, which is from you know, creating new brands, uh, the Chinese brands, the millennials finding out who they are uh, on one side through all the way to the other side where the rest of the world is stepping back from, from, uh, from, from a, a tighter, closer global planet. Everyone's trying to, you know, pulling back more protectionism and, and China's stepping into this role as the guardian of cultural assets. Mm. So from arts, museums, whatever, and, and all the, the tech components in the middle. Uh, third box, uh, consumption. Obviously, as we see the powerhouse of, uh, of consumer consumption uh, I is China. Um, you have another 400 million rural uh, population that is still left to move into the cities over the next uh, eight, 12 years, I don't think eight years left to move that lot in. Um, that's the equivalent of a whole Britain every year mm. uh, into a market. And not to mention the 100 plus million of Chinese that are leaving and going out overseas every year to travel. And so they're creating new brands, they're consuming new brands. Um, and the fourth area is creation, where China is creating new business models. Uh, for example, uh, ride sharing, bikes, mobike, mofo, that kind of stuff, to really creating and dominating technology uh, from EVs through to um, blockchain and decentralized things mm. and, and others, uh, whether it's an agri-tech or pharmaceuticals. So those are the four things we look at. Yeah, I mean, these, these are such exciting spaces as well. We'll dive in mm. into these in a little bit and talk about China matters and what that means on the macro level. You, you describe yourself as a VC firm and you said cross-border. Now, for those that don't understand the space so well, I mean, they're familiar with VCs and you know the investment world, but the idea of being a cross-border VC is actually quite rare, isn't it? There isn't a lot it's out there. Increasingly more uh, more common term. I mean, you, you start to, to see, hear, read. Uh, yesterday, the reason why we were here in Singapore is one of our um, portfolio family, uh, Beam. Um, they're a Malaysian company, mm. uh, but uh, it, obviously there a lot of their businesses here, and they held their cross-border, uh, China cross-border summit yesterday mm. in Singapore. So we were here to support them for that and, uh, and hold a dinner with various people. And so, you know, you, you had a thousand people at that at that summit, um, mm. and, and there's summits all through the region. I think this nature of cross border is is a byproduct of of this global China macro itself. Um, mm. The fact that you're getting, whether it's demand for for products from overseas into China, or one belt one road and policies like that that are driving Chinese growth through seventy plus countries. Mm. So as a as a as an investor or as a VC, I think you can no longer look at your backyard. I mean, I remember picking up a book uh, back in the early 2000s, I guess, that said, you know, we're out of Sand Hill Road somewhere, one of those crowd, you know, who, who, inspirational and, 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 you know, we admire them and we look up to them, we learn from them. But I remember one of the lessons it said was only invest in your backyard. Right. Right. It was, I remember it very yeah. clearly. It said, the further out you go, the less you know. That right. was, that was the, the little rhyming quote thing. The further <laughs> out you go, the less you know. It's amazing. So, so stay in your backyard. And that right? would be like 10 miles around no, Mountain View or Sand Hill Road. Right? Yeah, yeah. yeah, literally. Within, within 10 miles. Wow. So, and they said, you know, if you're the best people, they'll all flock there. Da, da. And that, that still may be true, et cetera, et cetera. But, you know, we look at that now and we say, well, I mean, Chris, you know, the companies in the, in, in the portfolio that you manage are from all over the place. And yeah. You're yeah. traveling to all over these countries. I mean, we can't Name stay a few in your countries. Backyard. Uh, one of the interesting ones recently was uh, Malta, which is mm. sort of an uh, interesting island in between uh, Africa and Italy. You know, uh, very uh, blockchain friendly, uh, 14 k's wide, uh, 400,000 people. 10% uh, of the GDP is from gambling. Uh, yeah. Interesting, but they've uh, fully regulated blockchain. Um, we've got uh, portfolio companies from Russia, yeah. uh, New Zealand, uh, Korea. You know, I think the you know the the fund, uh, the second fund we've got is a blockchain fund, and the thing with blockchain that's great is it's the nature of it being decentralized. It's it's sparked that development activity 
around the world. You know, I think there's more development activity in blockchain today than there was potentially in the internet phase. Mm. You know, uh, there's more development activity than anything else. Um, and it's literally a worldwide sort of movement there. Um, We're so seeing, what, 70% of our other, our main portfolio companies, the, the, you know, the, the macro for an early stage portfolio, mm. I'd say seven out of 10 of those portfolio companies are now building their businesses on main chains, on blockchain. Mm. Uh, and so that, I mean, that's a, a huge eye-opener for anyone. I mean, for us, of course, but for anyone. When yeah. you look at, the, these are not, you know, they're not, nothing to do with the hype or, or this or that or whatever anyone criticizes the, that whole world. But these are just normal businesses that are mm. high growth and doing exciting things, all reaching out to, to, to Chris and, and, and the team to say, well, how do we, which partners do we choose? Is there anything else in, in that other side of the portfolio that we need to work with? And that really is a signal, mm. right? Whether it's insurance, what have we got that's, that's moving from, from the yeah, from insurance? Uh, music? Yeah. Entertainment? Entertainment, yeah. yeah. Mm. Across the board. Yeah. Supply chain, like. And across many different geographies as well. Yeah. Which is fast, uh, different verticals, different geographies. But all, <coughs> all fill and funnel down to an existence or a hyperspeed growth existence due to China. Right. You know, like if China was not there, then these businesses wouldn't be there either. Well, let's talk about that. Let's yeah. talk about why. You know, what's, what's the, the driving factors? What are the, the meta input factors that are sort of, you know, creating this seismic shift? And the fascinating thing being is that, you know, I hope in 10 or 20 years' time when they listen back to this podcast, you said, yeah, no, we called it. It was happening. We, we were sort of identifying it. You know, if you go back in history, you know, there's a big, big seismic changes in history. The Reformation. You know, nobody <coughs> actually ever at the time said, yeah, we're in the middle of the Reformation. This is what it is. It was like 100 years later when they looked back and said, yeah, all these kind of things happen. You know, like this enlightenment of thought and the coffee shops and free press and so on and technology. Yet, I think it's a similar thing happening now. Absolutely. You know, we're seeing this seismic shift. And I think it's interesting that sitting here, you know, you two guys with these sort of interesting multicultural backgrounds are the ones who have identified it. Whereas those who are saying the further you go the less you know are kind of waiting for it that it to sort of come into their backyard aren't they say so, oh oh china we we need to do something about that now because it's kind of coming through the back door but you guys are there and saying no we've preempted it we're front running that whole trend and saying this is coming i think people get a little bit scared though don't they this is the problem they say yeah. oh china yeah, no, wait, hang on a second. If we buy the technology, it's going to have a back door in it to, <laughs> you know, et cetera, et cetera. Yep. You've heard it all before. Yep. So help us understand what's going on. What, what is this big meta trend we've talked about? Let's identify something. The middle classes, yeah. you know, the Asian middle classes as well, innovation, so on. I think there's um, decentralization is a big one, which I don't think there's enough being talked about the fact that decentralization and obviously underlying blockchain is uh, is. China's a large driver of that. We've got middle classes. Um, you've got the food supply issue. Yeah. Okay, I mean, it's the single largest population block on the planet. You don't think that they're, they're thinking about or concerned about food and water supply. Mm. And these are fundamental building blocks of life that, sure, there may be private companies thinking about these somewhere in the world, but this is a, a nation uh, thinking about this stuff and, and in turn, funding policy. Um, there's the fact that this is the only professional government in the world. What do you mean? Um, pretty much, I, I, and again, I'm, I'm not a, uh, I don't spend my life as a, as a student of, of governments, mm. but as an observer with some common sense, in pretty much any other country in the world, you can stand for or somehow be put into a place of government uh, leadership power, whatever mm. you want to call it. In China, to get to the top, you must have started at the bottom, mm -hmm. right? So if you read any of their backgrounds, any of their profiles, any of their CVs, of whether it's the, 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 the top 12 or the 1,388, whatever it is the, in the Politburo, or the rest of the, they are all somewhere down at the bottom as their start, whether it's a school teacher, right? right, Or, or they've run the local library. Um, you then become a, you know, a, a deputy, deputy municipal head. Then you go from there to your you know, commune, collective, whatever head. Then it's a state, state board of da-da-da, uh, state board of power, state board of et cetera, et cetera. Then you move it. And they rotate them around the country. 
Uh, you do different places, different provinces. It's just like a business. You would never end up running GE, right? Without having understood logistics, supply chain, sales, yeah. engineering. Just like most Fortune 500 companies that, that you know, we aspire to a model, have management programs, training programs. Chinese government, I mean, that's effectively what it is. You can't yeah. end up running that, <laughs> running the show if you're just from the outside going, yeah, I'm awesome, I think I'll run this thing. And I mean, that's a product, the fact that they don't have the ability for like right. to vote who's there. But we've seen what they can do in other parts yeah, of the world, so though. So come on, I'm like, you know, we're in living the world, the time yeah. of Brexit and yep. et cetera, et cetera. Yep. Not necessarily making the right decisions for ourselves, right? Yeah. And so these guys are, you know, but, but China's got a storied history of this, right? Mm. I mean, the the, gaohu, the, the, the civil service exam, um, you know, way back 2,000 years is, is a thing that, that pulled the country together, right? Every year there was a civil service exam, I mean, it was every few years, that, that people from all around the country would study for in order to pass this one central exam yeah, right. to, to get a qualification to be part of the government, to be part of the civil service, whether it was the tax collector or the, the border, whatever it was, as part of the empire or the emperor's you know, court. And so it, it, it's, a, it's a country or system that has 2,000 plus years of management skills, mm, right? Mm. And it often gets overlooked because West thinks, oh, we created the modern science of management. Um, you know, we, we know how to run things. It's like, yeah, I mean, you don't dis I'm not disparaging against anyone, but I think it's like, just hang on a second. Someone else or there are other people that also know that. Hmm. So that's a major power because you know, we see them do interesting things. And we as investors or our portfolios founders are the beneficiaries of that. Yeah. I mean, what was announced yesterday, I was just flicking through my LinkedIn. There was a one before I got on the plane, there was a announcement from the government that said, there was like 10 billion RMB in, uh, in, in grants or something, but the way they did it was intelligent. This was the thing that, that struck me. Um, it was, there was a, some money put aside. It wasn't even that much, and, but it was put aside not just to hand out to, to VCs or mm. hand out to founders. It was put aside or earmarked specifically to pay off loan interest. Okay. So can I, I, I and I'm sure someone will call in or, or type or whatever and say, oh, that's not new. And fair enough, I'm not saying it's the first time ever in the history of man. I'm just saying it was right. interesting to me that this money is marked for startups at a certain stage or certain phase of growth. And it's specifically to pay off loan interest. On the notes? On, 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 notes? on loans, right? Yeah, okay. on, on, on loans and notes that you've taken from private industry, right? So from right, banks right. and people, right? Okay. And so the reason why it makes is really interesting and why only a professional government could come up with it. So it was 100 million RMB, okay? Government funds, and what it will do is it will spur a 100x return. A 100x. Mm. Show me one other government <laughs> that's got a plan and says this is gonna return 100x. Mm. And those are kind of closer to the, <laughs> the returns you're looking at, Chris, mm. 100x. <laughs> but it's like, because the, 10, the 100 million that pays off the loan interest is like, if your loan interest is X percent, then that's going to create that much worth, 100x of 10 million, whatever it is, a 10 yeah. billion worth of loans that get created from private industry, mm. not hand out from government. So it's private industry that put the money because they're guaranteed the interest payments back. Mm. And you're only going to lend to a company that's performing, right? So now you put discipline into the system. Mm. And it's for a certain phase of growth of companies. It's not for baby companies that are just coming out the gates. But again, only a... Only a lens that's more mature, that sits back, yeah, yeah. and also that doesn't have to care about the populace, the vote, that says, well, right. you just wasted money. Well, it's part of our plan. Please sit down. Let us do what we're doing. Yeah. Right? I get, the, I get the, the feeling every time I speak to you about mm -hmm. China and I hear what comes out of China and I visit China, and the last time I was up at China Accelerator, is that, it, you know, there isn't a master plan out there but it seems like everybody's kind of like working on some kind of mark they're all look, there's a program there everybody's on board but there's right. no like you know okay let me get the master plan sure. where are we in like month six there isn't that but i don't yeah. know what it is whether it's in the dna or whether it's in the the, the culture or the conversations people have or in the media but there seems to be an idea that we're working towards this thing right and that would be like that company, is the master plan the mission statement yeah you know, we want to do this are you conscious of that you know with your you know your data laid lives do you see this sort of thing or feel it what is it to you yeah yeah i mean i, I generally see um one thing is i see a lot of confidence with the average sort of chinese citizen like with with where the government's taking them and where they're sort of going i guess they've seen 
a lot of positive change over the past you know years mm. um whereas you know compared to sort of back back home in sort of new zealand it feels like we sort of just sort of swimming you know yeah, um, treading water yeah treading water that, that's probably more like it so yeah it, it's nice to sort of go over there and everyone sort of focused and they seem to have a direction of where they want to want to get yeah. to um and I, I i like that it's it's inspiring you know mm. it's inspiring and it, it's, it's yeah that backed by hard work as well is the key isn't it because mm. let's talk yeah. about that i think when i came to china accelerate where we met that time yeah. and it was a national holiday. I met Kapil and he said, okay, I went right. to, to yeah. China Accelerator. And I landed, oh, the day before I landed, he said, oh, God, it's a, it's a national holiday. Why did you come today? Okay, we'll go over to China Accelerator's offices. And I thought, oh, it's going to be empty. No, it's, it's, it's I, I walked in, it was full yeah. house. It yeah. was there. And they were like drinking beer and like some of them were on the whiskeys already. But <laughs> it was like, you know, 11 o'clock in the morning. And I think you were doing a presentation, yeah. a talk, a mentor's yeah. talk, right? Every startup was there. And William was there as well. And it's like, wow. This is the hustle. I and mean, you talk about the nine nine, nine six. six. Yeah. Can we, like people may not be familiar with that. You know, you add that sort of master plan to the nine nine six. What is that? Is is a hell of a lot of progress. <laughs> That's right. what it is. But what is the nine nine six? Like um, for those who don't it's, know, it's uh, it's I guess it's vernacular or, or terminology for um, oh, for how we're working. Yeah. Right. So it's nine a.m. nine p.m. six days a week. Right. Startups or. Everybody. Everybody. That's just that's just status Part quo. Of the plan. Yeah, like I mean, people. You you'll read a lot or hear a lot of people saying it's good, it's bad, it's it's it, you know it doesn't work, it burns people out, whatever. I, I'm not I'm not I'm not giving you an opinion. I'm just telling you what it is. It's nine nine six. Yeah. So if you think about that, even if you don't even think of that nine nine part, and you just go okay, well, six, just six, right? Yeah. Six. Okay, that's a full day more, right? <laughs> like we all slack off. Just in, just in our five-day week. Yeah. So if we add another full s s day to this, that alone, shit, the productivity of that. Mm. You know, if you compare yourself to someone, and I'm pleased if anyone's French, I'm not disparaging France, <laughs> but I think there is like a, a, a two-day week, that no, a four-day week or something, right? Four-day week, yeah. yeah. So now you've got six hours, versus yeah. four. Now, I really don't... I mean, it doesn't bother me. I have no opinion on, on, on your work life balance or anything, right? But I'm mm. just saying that six versus four, that's 50% difference. Yeah. So unless you're superhuman and literally produce stellar, outstanding results day after day and have done and can do so with your eyes shut and just, you boom, you're at the top of the world, well, you're in for a hiding, yeah. right? I mean, and so if the whole country of one nearly and a half billion people yeah are working an extra 50 percent more than your country i mean how big's france 130 mil no no it's I don't know, 70 mil no no 60 60 yeah. yeah same as uk so you've yeah. got what 60 10 100 200 and something times bigger country right working 50 percent more it's going to take you a good 400 years to recover one year lost work yeah, like, stick to the wine, I think. Yeah. It's like, yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, okay, so let's talk about also, you know, China and Asia, because th this is interesting. We're here in Singapore, and Singapore is an interesting case. You've obviously come here, and there's a reason why you come here. So, you know, I'm interested to know a little bit more about that as well. Um, you know, Singapore is a wealthy country. Mm. It's an old country as in the sense that, you know, there are no babies being born here. I know this is a challenge, right? And it's, it's a tiny island. It's six million people. Um, very much a, you know, a success story you know, in terms of building an economy out of nothing, really. Yet at the same time, you know, we have this sort of comfort here, right? You know, it's a very comfortable world here in Singapore. Um, 996, like, you're lucky here in Singapore. I mean, you know, you, you're lucky to get somebody who isn't saying, five o'clock, um, anything else you want me to do? <laughs> right, I'm out here. So, <laughs> so, you know, this is the challenge because... You know, you can go work for a DBS or you can work for a large law firm or, you know, why, why, why work for a startup? You know, you can have it easy here. So when, when you come over here, just curious why you're here in the first place, because, you know, the hustle isn't here at the kind of level that you have over in Shanghai, for example. You know, that's that's tangible. They don't have the 996 here to some degree. Yeah, and also, is there also a danger long term with China that it becomes like Singapore in the sense that it, it becomes uh, successful and therefore comfortable? And therefore, the next generation of kids is, look, you know, I hustled so that you don't have to, you know, and I can put my kids into 
comfortable schools and so on and you know have the privileges and they don't have to then fight for work right so the thoughts about coming over here in singapore first and also like the future for china so why did we come here chris um we came here i think we came here mainly to support beam mm. um beam uh, is as i said is a, is a, a crew that's part of our, our family and um they they came through the the china accelerator program uh, I think, I think two batches ago, and um, they're they're originally from Malaysia. Um, we've never been actively or or purposely seeking out founders or, or investors in in um, in Singapore before, and uh, but they they were unusual and they stood out as, as founders during my t their time there and my time that I spent with them as an EIR, and they uh, were holding their annual summit uh, in Singapore. And so, so, like I said, we, we, as a team, we decided we'd support them and, and come along and, and, and see, see for ourselves uh, from, from, from that lens. And at the same time, we held a dinner last night um, where we invited our, uh, some LPs, um, some, some founders in the portfolio, uh, some other VCs that we've co-invested with before uh, mm. or, or our, our, our pipeline with us uh, and share deal flow and things. And then obviously some um, looking for potential new LPs um, for, uh, for new funds and also looking for advisors for, uh, for our portfolio companies. Again, you know, remember we're, we're, we're entrepreneurs and founders you know, in, our, in our DNA, so we're always looking for that, that extra component. So we, we pulled together a, a group of people that we wanted to, to bring together and we had a, we had a great night. Um, you know, it was really, it was a really good night. The, the turnout was amazing. <coughs> um, and that, that's why we came. Yeah. Um, and there's a lot of people interested in what you were doing over there as well. There's a growing connection. Yeah, big there? time. You know. And I think that that's, you know, that's, again, part of that uh, global China macro. Um, I had some interesting discussions last night with various people that are talking about Southeast Asia and the growth and, and you know, the number one of this and the number one of that and, and this, this growth in this market. And I think there, which is, and, and it was all true and valid and fair, but I think there was an, maybe only a handful of people understood that this growth, and this isn't to take anything away from any individual country or region, but the main driver of all of this growth is China. Yeah, no, it's absolutely. not by virtue of being whatever it is you are. It's that plus the fact that China is powering their plan through yeah. this region. And so, again, it kind of makes us see, and we have a couple of other companies in the portfolio or, uh, that, um, that are driving that growth through Southeast Asia, um, whether it's in the, the, the blockchain side of things or in the normal early stage. So we, we see that. Mm. you know on a day-to-day -day from that perspective yeah and there's been acquisitions that, i mean obviously alibaba lazada is yeah. a good example here yep. and you know you can't stay away from alibaba or tencent at one kind of level in terms of acquisitions or investments they're involved in every platform yep. now huge across southeast asia so we've uh, we've just moved into uh, alibaba's new headquarters new campus mm. um in uh, in shanghai in Hongqiao. um we have uh, a 20, square feet there um it's a, a, a blockchain related labs basically that we've, we've created with a mm. partner of ours uh, which is really exciting you know again that takes you to a whole new level right um and so that's that's cool that sounds like a lot of fun yeah it's you, great a creative sandbox for you as well yeah it's and, and you, you, alibaba as well and you know, i know people are obviously aware of them outside of china now because you know jack ma we, we, we've seen his funny face around and he's been at davos and he speaks really good english great now, you, I mean, let's sort of move that to the conversation about, I think it was yesterday, you and Robinsons? Today, right? this morning. Was this, yeah. Okay, so I think this is an interesting sort of case study. So, like, you, you went to Robinsons, which is a large, um, there's a shopping mall, and Singapore's all shopping malls, and some of them mm. are quite old as well, and you have, like, the hawker centers and so on. You went in there, and it, describe the scene that you saw, because it's an interesting sort of comparison to... Shanghai, or, yeah. you know, what you're used to. And this is sort of the conversation that leads back to Alibaba and retail mm. and so on. So what did you see in Robinson's? So th this morning, Chris and I had to split up. Chris had to go and, uh, and, and, and meet with um, <coughs> meet with someone from, uh, from, from a local bank. And then I had to go and meet with uh, a guy from, from Standard Chartered. Um, and I was with him in Robinson's, an apartment store, and, and it was just packed. It was so, so busy. Just human traffic just couldn't move inside this building. And I, I was thinking to myself, like, you know, I'd spent time with the with um, 
uh, as Jamie Nesbitt, he's head of, uh, of corporate clients, manages the top 20 clients in Standard Chartered. I, I've spent time with him in Hong Kong before, and it's like, I was like, last time, no, I remember this was years ago in Hong Kong that we were crammed like this. And he said, what is it like in, well, in Singles Day the other week in, in Shanghai? Yeah. Because it's like this today because it's, it's Black Friday, right? It's, and it's sales and everyone's running around and stuff. I was like, shit, Singles Day the other day. Nah, no different. Yeah. There's no people on the streets. There was no cramming and no, no stuck, nothing, mate. I mean, I could... But that's our image of China, isn't yeah. it, in the media, right? It's like those images you see of, like, New Year and uh, uh, people getting on the train. Not, nothing. I mean, I, it was just... There was no elbows being squished into me. And then he was like, shit, so we were doing all of this. All of this that we see and is stopping us from getting from A to B is to generate, like, a tiny bit of spend. And you've got normal daily routine, normal clean, you know, walkable streets, and you're generating trillions. Right. Why? Difference, well, other than Alibaba, difference is technology. Yeah. And then he went on to explain to me how crap e-commerce was in the region. And again, it's not bashing anyone, it's just showing that there's loads of room for improvement. Yeah. Um, and and it's, it's good, you know, we spend so much time trying to educate or tell people about, about China and, and about other parts, that, other things that we see. It's really good for us sometimes to be schooled as well. And today we're schooling, you know, to, to see, to be told, shit, you know, this is the stuff that we deal with. This is not what, you know, we don't see what you see. We see these things instead. And it's humbling and, you know, allows us to kind of put a new lens on stuff. Yeah, and also helps you sort of touch base with what other people really are thinking out there as well and what the reality is for them. I went to a, a conference the other day. I was speaking at a conference on a panel session and somebody stood up and did a presentation. They were from outside of Asia. They're, they're presenting about... Um, consumer identity and retail and so on. And they said, I'm going to show you a case study. And this case study is by Intel, Intel from the US, yeah. not obviously anywhere in Asia. And Intel have got this pilot, and this pilot is this store. And you walk into this store, and it's a pilot, right? So it's a one off, like one of these sort of mock ups. And you walk into the store, and you walk into the door, and it takes like a, a camera shot of your face. And then you walk in, and then it recognizes who you are. I'm like, this is a pilot. It's like, have, they, have any of these people actually <laughs> gone to China and see what's going on? What's the reality over there at the moment? I was like, well, hang on a second. And all these people were like, oh, yeah, this is amazing. <laughs> wow. I was like, hang on. Has anybody actually been to like Alibaba's store in China and had a look? This is like, you know, we're, we're beyond pilots right now. And all that, what's going on, even in a hair salon. So Chris hasn't seen our, our, uh, our new space as it's been kitted out yet. Like Chris was in Shanghai a few weeks ago. And just in the last few weeks, we've kitted all out. And I, I just... Before I left, we just uh, got our face recognition and our thumbprints and stuff done so we can get in our office. Yeah. And it blew me away. I mean, it, there's no delay. You don't stop. You don't pause. You just walk and the doors open because it just recognizes. And if it doesn't, trust me, everyone knows I didn't scan my face properly. And so I tried to go through <laughs> the door and the freaking red lights going off and the sirens going off and the guy come. So it catches you real quick, but it, it, it was just so smooth. Yeah. So I'm excited, like, uh, Hao Chen, um, our lead analyst, is in Singapore with us. He's on his way to Shanghai, and we're going to get him kitted out. And, you know, it's, 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 it's mind-blowing. Yeah. But, yeah, I mean, if Intel, one of the largest, most advanced tech companies in the world, are, are piloting stuff that's already real, it's a yeah. worry, right? Right. So, okay, I mean, just in, in rounding up, let's talk about, for those listeners, there may be people who are interested in China on the basis of they are a startup here in the region and they're wondering, what does it mean to me? You know, I'm in this space, what does China mean to me? And, and, and therefore the natural following is how do I get a part of that? How do I make it such something that works with me rather than comes and eats my lunch? So that's the first part. And also for investors, because he, here's the interesting part. Now people are looking at China, not because it's interesting, but it's part of their long-term strategy, whether they like it or not. And to use your phrase, Jeffrey, and I've used this plenty of times now, and I've stolen it, and I've, I'm, I'm going to stop crediting you at some point because I think now I'm actually doing the marketing. I'm doing the hard graph. It says, China may not be part of your plans, oh, yeah. but you're part of China plans, yep. China's plans. I tell people that, like, that's really good. Mm. Yeah, I know, I've worked on that one all mm. right. So like, <laughs> but yeah, anyway, so the point about the startups, and they're thinking about China. I'm a startup here in Singapore or Southeast Asia. You know, what, what do I need to know? Do I need to get out there? Do I need to put an outpost in China? Do I need to kind of make contact with the money in China or the Alibabas of this world? How, how do I make that work for me? 
thing. I, I'm going to let Chris talk about specifically the decentralized stuff. The, the in that blockchain world, um, that, that he has much more uh, length of exposure to than I do. I've realized in a short space of time that there are certain key lanes where if you, that's where you choose to play, then, then there is no other, <laughs> there's no other choice than, than if you're there. And I think you know, the, the labs en route and stuff, being able to help bring those other people in. What, what does it mean to, to overseas companies when you're talking to, to some of those projects and some of those teams and you're explaining to them what we have here mm. or what we have in China? Yeah, I, th I think the um, the opportunity to go over there and really experience it and see the the scale in which 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 things operate, uh, it's crucial, especially in the in the blockchain space. Uh, there's plenty of of room to move over there. There's lots of launch pads, and mm. uh, you know you find the companies really supportive there. The government's really supportive of the of companies when they come over there, um, and uh, it's really good. I mean, they move fast when they want to move in a certain direction. You know, especially. Um, you know, you sort of see places like, say, uh, you know, New Zealand or even, say, Australia and stuff like that, which they haven't said yes, they haven't said no, kind of like England with Brexit, you know, it's like you don't mm. know whether it yeah, is or it's yeah. not, and you don't really know which way to move, whereas sort of China sort of decided that they're going to go this way with it, and they sort of open the doors, and some things they say no, and when they say no, they're like, yep, no things like trading and stuff like that, but, you know, it's, it's you know exactly what you're getting over there, and, and, mm. and this is sort of a clear path forward. Yeah, I think that, to your point earlier on about certainty, the, the, the people, the population and business having certainty yeah. on things, it just makes it so much easier. There's no point in trying to tackle stuff that you, you know and it, yeah. Yeah, it's a waste of time. Yeah. Mm. But if you go the line that they want you to go, um, then you're, you're traveling at hyperspeed. Yeah. Um, you know, I mean, the, the labs that, 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 we're, that we're part of putting together en route, um, our partner there is uh, one of the founders of Didi, um, and like I said, we're in Alibaba's new campus, um, and we're bringing over companies both from our early stage portfolio, as well. Like you know, th and and helping. As I said, seven out of ten want to move into mm. need to adopt blockchain, and Chris's uh, the portfolio that he manages, the blockchain blockchain portfolio, and you're seeing top tier partners or leaders in the blockchain space from around the world, whether it's uh, Coinlist or Consensus and, and those kind of guys coming out to see what's happening uh, in China and, and needing to find a safe landing zone, mm. uh, needing to find people that, that can help them navigate, uh, that, get, that get it, um, and that are connected at that level in that area. Mm. And I think, you know, for me, um, watching Chris build out that portfolio and run that, that side of of, of, of high towers is really exciting. Yeah, know, absolutely. To see all that growth, it's it's, it's amazing. It's awesome. So, a thought experiment. Mm. Um, media company like Asia Tech Podcast, mm. where we're sitting. What would it mean for somebody like us, for example? Because you know we're not a, you know we're not building anything. We're not a blockchain company. We've got a blockchain show. Um, we've got a pitch deck show which features people who build stuff mm. in med tech and so on. Um, we're based here in Singapore. Um, what would it mean for us to go there, for example? Like, let's say just. For, you know, just let's explore it. What would it mean to take Asia Tech Podcast to China? Mm. Would it make sense? You know, would it be? You know, would we get into that fast lane? Would we have access to stuff that we don't have here? Yeah, I mean, of course. I mean, even in the space of well, this last year, um, there's been a bunch of people that have started content companies and things that the whole world now wants to know what the hell's going on in China. Mm. In the whole world, the the, the shifted so much in the last 18, 24 months, especially the last 12. And you know, if you think, oh, there's only room for like five key players that will be the blah, 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 and that's in the Western world or in the States, okay, well, then you're 300 million times five is 1.5 billion. <laughs> mm. Five times, that's 25 players you're allowed, right? Just for the Western world. Mm. Um, so absolutely there is. Um, there's, there's just so much stuff happening. And how, how do you go about that, though? Because what would be, because a lot of people... You know, startup founders would be saying, okay, so what's the first step? Is it to find a launch pad or so it's a sort of, you know, do you approach people like yourself and say, oh, okay, can you find me space at least to kind of like yeah. bed in, like test it out for three to six months? How, how, what's the normal process for a startup from the outside who wants mm. to come and start up? Normal startups, uh, except I have a role as EIR at China Accelerator, which is the most successful accelerator, the most well known accelerator in, in China from China. Um, it's run by uh, William. 
and, and Oscar, you know, that <laughs> they get hundreds of applications. We take two batches a year. Um, you know, that's a place to start. Um, that's a b the best place to start. Uh, if you're a hardware specific one, um, there's there's Hacks mm. Accelerator, which is also part of SOSV, and that's down uh, down south in in, uh, in in Shenzhen, where the hardware capital is. Um, there are there are hundreds of other accelerators for specific sectors, specific areas, and obviously, from our perspective, um, you know, if if you're a if you're a blockchain decentralized company anywhere in the world, and no matter what size you are. Um, like I said, the from, from consensus, coinless, down to a startup, if you would like to look at China, mm. um, then, you know, on route labs um, is, is probably the place to, to start and, and, and talk to us and, and we'll have a chat and see what we can do. Um, yeah, I mean, shit, China matters, right? <laughs> China matters, dude. I mean, Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, he knows when to drop the sound bite. <laughs> he knows it's near the end of the podcast. <laughs> Jeffrey, Chris, it's awesome having you here. I really enjoyed having a chat with you and find out a bit more about yourself and also what your, your plans are and what you've been working on. A um, couple of questions before you go. Um, what is the best way for people to reach out to you? What is the, your preferred channel? Not everybody has WeChat, you know, in the world. So how do you like people to contact you? Those who are saying, look, I, I heard your interview, loved what you were saying. Um, maybe they're in the blockchain space, maybe they're not. But, you know, how do we take this forward? I want to have a chat. Yeah, you can you can find us on LinkedIn or jump onto our website at Hightail Capital. Um, yeah, ping us a note. Yeah, the usual. Or your usual. Tele, tele guys. Instagram. In Instagram. <laughs> 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 like my post on Instagram. Yeah. And let me know that you're here. Yeah. All right. No, that's cool. So we will put all the details in the show notes. Yeah, search hashtag China Matters seriously, um, and and you'll you should find our pieces somewhere. Yeah. Um, we're quite vocal. We write a lot. We see. We we speak what we feel and what we see. Yeah. Um, so yeah. It's good. Two awesome. very awesome guys as well. And I look forward to a part two at some point in Hell some yeah. time, somewhere in the world. I'm not sure where that might be. Could be in Shanghai. Could, Could be, be somewhere. Could be in Auckland. Could be in Auckland. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> exactly. Could, that's how we roll. We're global. So Jeffrey Handley and Chris. Thank Let you me get so this. Much. Grimshaw Jones. Awesome having you, both from Hightail Capital. And you are speeding off back to, are you heading back to Shanghai after Hong Kong after this? Hong Kong. Yeah. Yeah. Hong Kong and Shanghai. Yeah. Um, yeah. Th thank you so much for having us on today. It's great to have you here. Thank you. Enjoy Lion City whilst you're here. And Mer Lion City. Uh, yeah, that's right. And we look forward to part two. Awesome. awesome. Thank you, Graham. Thank you, Graham.